I'm Brian Carpenter, host of Fresh Air at Five, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another great episode of My EdTech Life. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Thursday evening. That's right, it is Thursday. I know normally you all are used to seeing the show on a Monday and Tuesday, but you know what? Sometimes, like I always say, when the stars line up and you're able to get into the show in with just an amazing platform and an amazing guest, you always go for it. So today, I am excited to be here this evening with you all. And before we introduce our guest and we get into the meat of the matter, I just absolutely want to give each and every single one of you a big thank you for all of your support. Thank you for making My Ed Tech Life what it is today. We appreciate all the listens, all the shares, the follows, the comments on social media, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, and so on. We really appreciate every single one of you. So thank you so much for all of that love. Thank you so much for all the great feedback and the wonderful reviews. You guys have been outstanding. And as you know, we do what we do for you. So week in and week out, we can bring you some amazing conversations such as the one that we will be having today. So today, this evening, I would love to welcome to the show, Mr. Mike Tang, from, excuse me, from Swing Education. And I'm excited to talk about this uh, topic today because I think it's something that sometimes it's something that might be overlooked, maybe heavily overlooked. So today, guys, you're in for a treat. So Mike, how are you doing this evening? I am doing great. And I hope everyone else is doing great too. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. And Again, before we get to know a little bit more about Swing Education, Mike, if you could do us a little favor and give us a little brief introduction about who you are, what you do, and what your context is within the education space. Yeah, I guess I'll, from a career standpoint, I I grew up wanting to be a software engineer. My dad was a software engineer. So I feel like I was always just kind of following in his footsteps. And I grew up in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. So I went to college, came back, became a software engineer. I did that for six years at a big company and then a little company. And I ended up in education because I heard a This American Life radio episode about the Harlem Children's Zone. And I'd always done a decent amount of volunteer work in mentoring or tutoring. And I don't know exactly, I couldn't tell you exactly what it was. I think a combination of just like right place, right time, hearing this thing, I was kind of miserable at the job I was at, but I got really inspired and I I just decided I needed to be in education reform or just also helping to effectively try and be ending poverty the way the Harlem Children's Zone was in New York. And so I ended up starting to look for jobs in education and came across a a job posting on Craigslist at a charter school here in San Jose, California, and started working for them as the head of instructional technology. So that's how I got into education. That was like 2010 or 2012. Wow, that is amazing. You know, and and it's interesting because pre-chat, we were kind of talking a little bit about, you know, what I do. Just you asked me for a little brief background. And of course, going from business into education and being in education for 17 years. And then yourself also kind of in a path of, you know, being a software engineer and then transitioning into education since uh, 2012, like you mentioned, and, you know, becoming, working at a charter school and really transferring those skills over. So let me ask you, let's go ahead and start with that as we build up into swing education, just out of curiosity, because a lot of educators, you know, did transition, or there might be some people that would like to transition into education. You know, what was it your initial experience once you came into the education space? And, you know, and and of course, jumping into a charter school, especially with that software engineering background. Yeah, uh, it was really interesting, I would say. So I think it was amazing. I feel like working with 
and alongside people that I didn't have to feel like were I was competing with in any way from like an ambition or career ambition standpoint. I think working in for profits and or at least my experience, I should say, previously in for profits was kind of like I made friends and stuff, but you were kind of never really sure, like, okay, so like, oh, there's only so many people up for these promotions and there's raises that are being doled out. And I don't know, it always felt very competitive in a way that I think working at a nonprofit wasn't. I feel like working at the charter school in a nonprofit environment, serving at risk communities felt much more like I was on the same page with all of my colleagues. And I thought that was incredibly refreshing, super, super fun. It allowed I think everyone to just feel like we were all rowing in the same direction most of the time. And I thought that was such a good feeling. I do think it was interesting having to adjust, call it my communication style. I think even, I, I think when I joined, I thought that this charter school environment might be different from a public school district environment because people did come maybe from more for-profit backgrounds. And in the end, I think it was interesting because I would, at the beginning, I should say, I was trying to advocate for things where it might be more efficient or a cost savings. And I realized that it didn't translate that well because it, at this place where everyone was so mission driven, I had to translate the efficiency or cost savings into call it academic outcomes in order for it to resonate with people. And it just made sense. It was just like a really basic learning of what what actually motivates my colleagues in order to kind of have myself be more influential or get things done. So anyways, I, I thought it was super fun though to finally be in a place where everyone was really mission driven. Wow, that is great. You know, that that's interesting. And thank you so much for that wonderful description and that story. You're absolutely right in the sense that coming from marketing and sales and then transitioning into education was very different for me, but in a very similar way to you. Like you mentioned, it's like you found a group of people that are all, like you mentioned, going in one direction, really, you know, working and looking for student outcomes, making sure that we provide learning experiences for them, that students are doing yeah. very well. And, you know, it feels like it's just a nice collective of people that are just, again, like you mentioned, all going in the same direction. And really, you know, it, it I didn't see any of very similar, like you described, a lot of that competition, like you would in sales and all this other stuff, right. you know, it was just like, hey, we're here, we're here to make a difference. And you just really buy into that. And it's just been great. And like I said, 17 years later, here I am still in education. And totally. it just, it's been great. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, also, what I do like is that coming in from outside of education, and like, and what I mean by that is not going the traditional education route, maybe through our schooling, but coming in right. from that business side, and in this case, your software side, but kind of still even with software, you kind of get to see a little bit of that business product, you know, approach and so on. But the way that those skills translate so well into the education space and seeing things very differently, that is also a huge bonus to what it is that we do and actually applying it to our craft. So that is amazing to, to hear. So I want to ask you now, you know, you're coming in from software engineering, coming into a charter school. And sure. again, the position that you mentioned was instructional, instructional head software, of instructional technology. Yeah. Okay. Head of instructional technology. So, wow. So how was that, you know, change from software engineer to now this new position where you're now in charge of really providing training for teachers and obviously that same tech, putting it in the hands of students. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it was just a lot of fun, I think, to be able to apply a lot of the things that I'd learned in software engineering to, for sure at the time, call it an industry that like largely had moved much in a long time. I mean, I kind of remember describing to friends of mine, like that I'm now living in a world where like Internet Explorer 6 was like the recommended browser, even though like Chrome and things like that existed. And I, I think actually, you know, at the charter school at Rocketship, we ended up transitioning 
to say Chromebooks really early on. Like we were really early adoptees of that because from an IT standpoint, they're just so simple. Like we could basically say, look, if it doesn't work and you've tried turning it off and on again, then we just swap it out for a different one and then like ship that one back to the company or, you know, to get returned. And so I think that that was all really fun. And, you know, I think actually what was funny is you mentioned training teachers on the technology. And so one of my early couple years there experiences was we would have days where the teachers would be in training or a half day and we'd have to find subs to teachers, even as like our technology department would be responsible for finding subs for those teachers for those days. And I would end up calling these agencies and things like that to try and get the substitute teachers that we needed in order to get the training for our full-time teachers. And that was my first interaction with like what it was like to find a substitute teacher. It was my job in some cases to do that. And it, it's really like that kind of led to swing education because after a few years, I started asking neighboring schools and districts how they do it. Why is this such a challenge? Why are these agencies so mean, frankly, like some of the agencies I was talking to, I felt like they were just kind of rude to me. And it ended up being that there just didn't feel like there was a good solution. So I ended up starting swing education with a couple of high school friends, actually. And so we were kind of off to the races at that point. Excellent. And you know, that's great, because that's a nice segue into obviously getting into swing education. But I want to thank you because you know, what you described gives us a little bit more context. And your experience doing that. And I just want to revert back to a little bit about my experience too, because yeah. like you mentioned, uh, you know, when I was still in the classroom, I never really saw what went on, you know, in the behind the scenes when I did ask to go to a training session or I was sent to a professional development, you know, you just, they tell you, Hey, you're going to just show up to your professional development and you're good. But exactly like what you're describing, it's like, well, somebody has to have or find that sub or you just say, hey, can you put in for a sub for me? Because I'm going to be at a professional development. And then obviously, like our system within our district, I'm not sure how the current system works because I don't call in for subs and I don't do that training on in that aspect. But before we used to have to input in the system or by phone and then a sub would tell us, hey, here's my code. And please put this in and I, you know, put yep. my name in and, you know, and then you find those subs that are really good that you really want to come back or you want them to come back because they do very well with the kids and, and they do the handouts and everything that you leave, you know? And so I found that fairly easy, but at the same time, that was many years ago. And of course the technology back then was still, you know, a little rough to kind of maneuver for a lot of, of our teachers, but now I'm curious, like you mentioned, with your experience, you so you have to reach out to agencies. And the only reason I want to just ask a little bit. Oh, no, that was just my experience when I was working at the charter school. Right, right. So that's yeah. why I, I just wanted to ask about that, because some of my audience members may not be familiar with that, because in our districts, it's people apply yeah. to be a sub for at that district. district. So, yeah. yeah, at the district. So we call yeah. them. But you had to reach out to an agency. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about how that worked for you? I know you told us you had some bad experiences, but were there several agencies that were available uh, for you to call? Yeah, so we we had both. We had our own kind of people that had applied to our charter school to be substitute teachers. There was a list of them. It was a Google sheet that got printed out, you know, and then what I think if that wasn't enough, we oftentimes then also reached out to these external agencies to try and get, get additional help. I think sometimes when we were proctoring tests and things like that too, that was a thing that we utilized as like extra help on that regard. And yeah, I mean, it was kind of miserable, right? Because I think then a lot of that coordination is on me of trying to piece together how many of our own subs are available, how many are from this external agency, what is the cost here at that point? I did mention that they were kind of rude. You know, I mean, oftentimes if it was like, okay, well, look, we need five people this day. And they're like, well, you're only going to get four, okay? Like you called too late or something like that. I'm like, all right, well, look, 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 like, just don't need to be mean about it. Like, let's talk about it. Right. And I, I think it's just, I don't know. I, I, I oftentimes think 
I mean, it goes back to sort of what I liked about being in this nonprofit space or in K-12 maybe is I think what I learned during my time working as an operator in K-12 was that I think almost everybody to a person is just trying to do their job well so they can help kids and teachers. And I think that gets lost a lot of times because, you know, you might have charter schools that are talking bad about districts. You might have districts doing the same about charter schools. It might be the teachers union saying that the districts are doing whatever or the district saying that the teachers union doesn't care. And I think what I've found is pretty consistently when I talk to an individual person, everyone actually really cares about the kids. And I think it's really worth coming back to and reminding ourselves that. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. So now let's go ahead and talk about swing education now that we really understand it. You know, and that's interesting. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing that story and your experiences with these agencies and how difficult it was for you. But what I love that you mentioned too is because of that issue and that problem, you said, hey, well, why don't we come up with a solution? So now tell us a little bit about how that idea came about. And like you said, you worked with some high school friends to come up with yeah. swing education. And I'm sure that this was probably a catalyst to inspire swing education. So tell us a little exactly. bit about how, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I had had that experience year over year of needing to source substitute teachers essentially for projects that I was initiatives I was working on at the district or at the charter school. and then. The person who was in charge of substitute teachers at our charter schools came to me and just asked if there was a better way that they could be coordinating with the substitute teachers, having the schools directly coordinate with them, et cetera. And I started to look into it. And again, this is kind of where I started going to our neighboring schools, other charter schools, other public school districts, some private schools, and just asking how, how do other people handle this issue? And I think it was pretty consistent that what I ended up hearing was there were some solutions, call it, for actually the coordination piece of it, right? Like, I mean, when you have to go get a substitute teacher at your district, you're likely going into some website and saying, hey, I need a sub this day. Or actually, I think what a lot of people are saying is I'm going to be out this day. And you can find someone through that system. But oftentimes, there's just a shortage. And that's what I ended up hearing really consistently, even at our own schools was, yeah, I can ask till I'm blue in the face for a substitute teacher. But if national fill rates on average right now are about 70 to 75%, one in four or more are not getting filled. And I have this, I have a second grader at our local public school and, you know, recently they could like his teacher was out and then another kindergarten teacher was out later in the week. And they couldn't find subs. So they took those classes of 20 kids or so and split them into groups of three and spread out those little cohorts of kids, the three person cohorts of kids amongst the K through two classrooms. And so some of the kids, you know, two thirds of them roughly didn't even actually get to stay in their own grade level classroom for that day. And so it started to feel just like a little bit of a mess. And I ended up reconnecting with these two high school friends to people I'd known for a really long time at that point, really close friends, one of whom I'd worked with for four years as a software engineer. And I told them what I was working on and my nonprofit and they were between jobs effectively. So they were just like, yeah, let me help you out. And they started helping me. And one thing led to another, we ended up starting a company kind of full-time instead. Wow. That is amazing. And You know, it's very interesting, like you mentioned, just because of the experience that you had, obviously, number one, when you're you're in the role of having a contact sub, so that's number one there. But also now that you describe what, you know, was going on with the school and having to divide the kids up and being in a mixed group, not your normal element, that can really take a toll on, you know, your students because they're not within their same group or cohort Now they're mixed in with some older kids and different grade levels, which is definitely something that, you know, it, it's not the ideal situation, obviously. Yes. So being the fact that you're seeing that and now reaching out to your friends and, and, you know, saying, Hey, 
you know, this is the problem that we're trying to do and trying to solve. And now you come up with a solution with swing education. So tell us now a little bit about how swing education works in connecting, you know, not K-12 to, you know, having a pool of subs or, you know, just being able to not experience what you experience with some of these yeah. agencies. So tell us how that works. Yeah. So I think, you know, our approach initially was that we realized that because a substitute teacher has to go to each individual school district or private school or charter school organization separately. I mean, the term that I would use for it is that it's very fragmented. Each district and organization is running its own kind of ecosystem of substitute teachers. They're calling separately. They have their own application and background check process. They have their own payment relationships with these substitute teachers. And it's work for each substitute teacher to have to go to each of these individual organizations. And there's a limit to how much work people are willing to do in order to kind of apply and go through those processes. And so I think we initially just thought of it as like, there should just be a single ecosystem for like a common application for substitute teachers to be able to get into these school districts. And then as an organization, I think the other thing then that we're really providing them is a home, you know, like I've oftentimes thought of substitute teachers as like the orphans of the teaching world. They don't have a home, right? They don't have a support system at a particular school district. And in fact, if you ask for too much support, you might just not get called back. Like you might just be seen as like someone that's high maintenance or whiny or whatever else, right? Like I think you can complain or provide feedback and it could be viewed as a complaint. And again, you might just be losing out on work opportunities. Whereas I think when they come to us, we're able to kind of filter that through to principals or school districts in a way that benefits everybody really. Because again, no school wants to be a bad environment for substitute teachers, but it can be hard to hear that sometimes, right? I think everyone can sometimes naturally feel a little defensive to, to critical feedback. So yeah, I mean, I think that that's where our starting point was, is like, how do we provide this way of substitute teachers getting into the classroom as quickly and as easily as possible? And then by definition, then if we can bring on those schools and districts, then they'll find each other and we can help them make good matches. Oh, that is great. You know, and that's something that is wonderful because I know, at least from my experience and what I see, it's like we talked a little bit about earlier, every district has their own pool of subs. Yeah. And then, of course, like I mentioned, you know, the more that you get sub jobs, the more people know you. And really, th what I remember is the, the subs would really be there selling themselves that, of course, they, they'd be like, okay, hey, I'm in a fifth grade classroom. But hey, Mr. Mendoza, like, if you ever need a sub, here's my card. And don't forget about yeah. me and don't forget. So they're kind of like, hey, we can get, they need to get more jobs. They're anxious to work. They love what they do. And they're willing to serve the community. That's great, you know, and and so normally now what I see is they bring in the substitutes at the beginning of the year. They do an onboarding session with them as far as, you know, yep. these are the tools that are only accessible to you. They don't get like, you know, obviously the full teacher access. They get the bare minimum, but here's the training. But really, it's just a little two hour long training that they get. And then that's it. They're done. Yep. Obviously, they get vetted and so on. So. What I want to ask, and just so we can be clear, like for everybody listening, what your platform does too is, like you said, you're kind of a matchmaker, you know, finding subs for schools. But I'm right. sure that it, you also handle some of that background check or background or work. Totally. Uh, yeah, to make sure that every sub would be suitable yeah. for that district. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're doing that. We have every incentive to have a high bar from that standpoint. And then, you know, we provide that as a service almost to substitute teachers because now they can work with any school district that we have on our platform. School districts still have choices. Individual schools even can tell us, hey, we may not want this substitute teacher back for whatever reason. And sometimes people have a bad day, so we have to be empathetic to that. But, you know, again, that substitute teacher has our support. We might help them coach them through things. We've had really good success with remediating that kind of like feedback to substitute teachers. And maybe they can't go back to that school. First impressions do matter. And I don't want to make that, you know, not legitimate. But I think what we found is a lot of, especially 
early in their career, substitute teachers can go on to have a lot of success in the classroom. And in, in this very acute teacher shortage that we have right now, I really believe that we should be giving as many people opportunities to be successful as possible. Yes, absolutely. Mike, you hit on something that was wonderful that you mentioned that you help the substitutes. Like, for example, that example that you gave us where maybe either a certain school might have said, you know what, you know, maybe this sub we can kind of take off of our list. But I love the fact that it 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 doesn't seem like kind of like that agency work in the sense like, hey, man, they don't want you back. Sorry, man. Like, we're going to have to let you go. It's more like, hey, you know let me help you. Let's work through this. And you coach them up. I think that that adds so much value because like you mentioned, it's like, you know, people want to go in there. They want to sub, like you mentioned some, even some subs may be future teachers there that are wanting to get some of that experience just to see what it is like and say, Hey, you know, is this suitable for me? Maybe not. Maybe it's just, you know, let me just continue working. And maybe they say, Hey, you know, I get to try out all different grade levels, see where I'm comfortable. But I love the fact that you just don't dismiss them. And you say, let's go ahead and work through this. Let's reflect on what might have happened. And let's see how we can coach you up. So I want to ask, you know, exactly what kind of coaching up do you all offer for the substitutes? Yeah. I mean, before I answer that, and I will get to it, I will just back up a bit and say like, you know, that coaching and wanting to provide people with opportunities to be successful and all people, right? All backgrounds really is core to like who we are at Sway. I think we have a very diverse corporate employee group too. And we have a really diverse substitute teaching group. And I think that's really important because I think students need to be able to see themselves reflected in teachers. It won't be every single day, right? But like, hopefully by and large, that's what they'll see. And I think it's so important. I mean, there's so much research that shows that that matters. And that's why it's important not to dismiss, right? To actually understand what was the problem this day for you. And we're, we're willing to talk with them about it. Honestly, sometimes it's really simple because maybe they came from an early childhood background where, you know, if you're dealing with toddlers, sometimes you got to grab a kid by the arm a little bit and just hold on to them to keep them physically safe. And that's not okay in a lot of like K-12 environments. And so sometimes it's really simple of just making sure they understand the translation. Sometimes we have people who are new to the classroom that think it's okay to step out for a second to go get help that they need from another teacher or whatnot. And like, they forget, hey, Every classroom's got a radio, right? That's what it's there for so that you don't have to leave students unattended. And these are really ultimately most of the time, we'll call them like unforced errors, right? And I'm not, I would never dismiss the school's concern that that took place. But I also think sometimes some very basic education or just like, hey, don't do that will get us there. But also having that empathy to say to them, hey, like, how, how did the rest of the day go? What were the good parts of the day, right? And like, let's also remember and keep those things too. And I think that, again, all of these kinds of things, that level of empathy, I think, goes a long way. That is amazing. Like, Mike, I'm really like in awe and blown away at what you're telling me about swing education. Like I said, this, this you know, prior to the show and, of course, you know, making this show happen, it wasn't until that point in time that I had learned about this and I was – This is amazing, like, because I had never heard of anybody offering the type of service that you offer for the school's benefit, but also to benefit the substitute and giving them those trainings. And like you're talking here, you know, that empathy of, hey, no worries, let's build you up, let's look at the good things. And then, of course, matching them up possibly with another school or whatever the case is, and, and but you're continually working with them. And I, I've never heard of that. And what I love about it is because of the experience that you had, you saw something from the outside that maybe many of us that have been in education for many years don't quite pick up or see. And you definitely have come up with something that is wonderful and really inspiring. And I hope that all our audience members that are catching this episode, either rewatching it or listening actually hear what it is that you're offering and can really 
maybe bring this up to their schools and, you know, see what can be done. So before we get a little bit more into that, I I, I have to ask, and I want to ask, does swing education, is it just uh, maybe regionally working regionally right now, or is this something that has already branched out nationwide? Yeah. Good question. We're in seven states. I'm going to include DC, Washington, DC as a state, but it's California, Texas, Arizona, New Jersey, New York, and Illinois, and then Washington, DC. So we're not everywhere. I wish we were because I definitely get pings from school districts or even like state offices of education saying, hey, it'd be great if you came to where we are. And I would love to do that. But I think you know, uh, to go back to like who we're serving today, I think it's really important to do that at a high level. And we need that kind of density in order to provide a good service to both substitute teachers and to schools and districts. So it'll come, but it might take, it might be a couple more years until we're, we're kind of everywhere. Oh, perfect. I love that. So then I want to ask, like, let's say if you can walk me through the process, let's say that I am a, let's say high school principal. And I let's say that I am a member or a part of now swing education. How would that process kick off if I am needing a substitute? If you can just kind of walk us through that so our audience members can kind of get an idea of how the process works and how yeah. swing education is able to match up substitutes for schools or maybe even particular grade levels and so on. Yeah. So we try and put as much of it, call it behind the scenes as possible, right? And have the principal facing in this case experience be as simple as possible. So at its most simple, that person at the school that's requesting a substitute teacher goes on the website and logs in and says, you know, what grade date subject are they looking for somebody for they enter that and a notification essentially goes out not simultaneously but it's it's stepped a little bit to our substitute teachers that are in the area that you know have made themselves available effectively and i think what happens then is that a substitute teacher hopefully sees that accepts the job and then you can see they can see the details about the school the school can see the details about that person you know their profile their photo etc and then hopefully that person shows up on time, has a great day, and then we get some feedback that says this person did well. Behind the scenes, when I'm talking about the matching and things like that, you know, we also see when a substitute teacher has been preferred by other schools by name or by a specific teacher, or if they've gotten positive feedback in the past. And so we're able to prioritize substitute teachers that have had those kinds of experiences in their work history with us. And they might get the notification first, or they might, you know, or they might be prioritized in this case. And so I think that there's things like that that are happening. We also have a Swing Heroes program where regionally we as a company will say, hey, we, will, we have a job on Friday or Monday, which tend to be the days teachers get sick. And there may not be a specific opening or job yet because we might not hear about it till Friday morning. And that substitute teacher is signed up. We're going to guarantee them income, whether we can find some work for them or not. But by and large, we are able to find work for them and then we can slot them in. And so sometimes that's happening behind the scenes for a principal that's asking right on a Friday morning. But there's all kinds of things like that. Yeah. That is amazing, Mike. Like, you know, it, it seems like you've really thought through this whole process. And that's something that I appreciate. Like I mentioned to you, you know, being in the classroom back in my day, it was very different. But now, obviously, with technology and what we're seeing now where we may have, you know, some of those teacher shortages or you'll have schools, obviously, that may not have enough personnel to cover. And now you're breaking up classrooms. But the fact that you're able to provide a solution with that through swing education and you're equipping the substitute teachers and you're helping at least to some extent, like you mentioned, if there is a preference from a certain school or a certain grade or so on and so forth to be able to match them up and really bring somebody in that is quality, that definitely wants to be there and is really anxious to, you know, contribute and say, Hey, you know, I'm part of this, but also that, they are well taken care of. And to me, that that is really just really stand up, Mike. I, I'm really like 
taking this in right now. And I'm like, this is wonderful. I had never heard or seen of anybody doing this and the fact that you're doing it and you're doing it so well and the way that you've explained it. I'm just really blown away. So I want to ask Mike now, how long has Swing Education now been in uh, business? Yeah, we started in 2015 and this is about eight years now. This is our eighth school year or ninth school year. And it's been awesome. I mean, I think each year it gets bigger. I can't believe sometimes how, how many schools, substitute teachers, days we're filling on, on any given day. And it's hundreds of thousands of days each school year now. And it's, it's pretty amazing. Wow, that is amazing, Mike. And so I want to ask you, you know, if you don't mind sharing, I mean, you don't have to disclose any other information or school districts or anything like that. But I just want to ask, you know, if you can share some success stories of how swing education has positive, positively impacted, whether it was a school or a school yeah. district and also a su the substitute teachers alike. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell a very specific story from when when we kind of started early on, but and I think it'll touch on a lot of the, the reasons why we do what we do and how we do them. But, you know, I'm talking about making it accessible to get into the classroom easy and fast and things like that. And early on, we were just working in the Bay Area where we started the company here in California. And it was my co-founder, Asha, and I that were reaching out to substitute teachers personally. And there was this one substitute teacher that we, I think it was probably our third time, like paying them. We were like, hey, we saw you applied. We really would love to have you. Can you come? Like the next step is to get this background check done. And she ended up replying really apologetically, actually, which I, I feel really guilty and bad for in, in now. But she basically said, hey, I just moved from Georgia. I had, I was a full-time teacher there, but I can't like, it costs money to translate my credential from Georgia to California. And I'm basically living paycheck to paycheck right now. By the time I get my paycheck, every dollar is accounted for, and I can't afford the background check and to translate my credential right now. And, you know, look, admittedly, I think my co-founder and I, I'll say both come from some amount of like privilege. And I think it was hard for me to imagine at that point that even $150, $200 might stand in the way of somebody getting a job. But this person expressed it so well. It was like, okay, like, I think we need to change how we think about this as a company. Like, we ended up meeting with her two days later. I met with her two days later, and we swiped my credit card, paid for all that for her. It wasn't specific to swing. She could now work for any school or district in California. But... We did that and we said, hey, we can we can make sure you have, you know, plenty of substitute teaching opportunities, long term subbing opportunities. And she did that. She worked for us for two years and she was both incredibly grateful to us, but we were so grateful to her. Right. I mean, that was like this story that goes on to basically make or break your business. And she's a full time teacher in California now, now to this day. Right. And. I feel like she probably would have gotten there regardless. I don't want to take anything away from her, but I think I can say pretty confidently we made that happen more quickly for her. Hopefully we made her feel like that, that she wasn't alone in trying to do that. And I think that that feels really important, right? And the schools that she ended up working for were super excited to have someone that was a full-time teacher and had experience. And she worked for, I mean, a lot of long-term kind of positions for us um, during that time period because she was really qualified for them. Wow. Mike, this is something that is wonderful. Like really, this this is a really touching story. It, it's really just, a, a, I don't know, I, I can't describe it. It's really just seems like it, it's a work from the heart from what you've seen and the fact that the, the treatment that the substitutes are getting is just something that is wonderful that they're well taken care of. Like you said, the coaching up, making sure that they get the jobs and matching them with the schools, but the work that you're doing also for the school district as well, and being able to find qualified individuals and just individuals that want to be there. So the day can keep going to avoid the little pods of, you know, students moving into mixed grade levels where they shouldn't be so that instruction can continue moving forward and just continue to, you know, press forward during this time where there may not be 
you know, maybe enough substitutes that that school or have signed up for that school. So I think that the work that you're doing is very commendable. And especially now in uh, the times that we're in, where we continually hear in the news of teacher shortages and now what's happening to the students in the classrooms, who's overseeing them, you know, how are they, you know, are they putting them in big classrooms and so on. So I think that what you're doing is something that is wonderful and something that is really needed. And hopefully it is, is, has more attention brought to it because this is amazing what you're doing. And I, I thank you because you definitely have a kind heart too, as well as obviously you shared this story with us on how you were able to help a transitioning teacher from one state to another and, you know, taking it from there. So I, I don't, I can honestly see why you are very successful and why you continue to grow and why you're, you know, in seven states like you mentioned earlier. So thank I just you. want to say thank you, Mike. Thank you for no, what you're thank doing. Thank you for saying all that. I, I think <laughs> it's, it's, I have a lot of gratitude for having the opportunity and being able to help people. And I think, you know, to a person at, at Swing, we love doing that. Yeah, no, I definitely see it. And like I said, I, I'm just really excited about, you know, everybody that's going to catch this episode later on. Like, I just want to put it out already and be like, hey, make sure that everybody listens and so on. So I know I've been sharing your website there as well. So that, that way people can go ahead and uh, pay a yeah. visit and hopefully get it shared out to school districts and, you know, they can reach out to you more. I know that you're located here in Texas. I mean, I'm in deep South Texas. So I want to ask that too, just to, so we can clarify. So for example, you said that you do work here in Texas. Now, is that like yeah. just right now, are you just in a region in Texas or does the service right. cover all of Texas or does it depend on the demand for yeah. a certain area as well? We're trying to stick to certain areas and be concentrated there. So I think right now for us in Texas, it's Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and Austin. But like I told you before, we we hopped on live too. Or is I've been down to, to South Texas and would love to would love to help there too. Hopefully soon. Absolutely, that would be great. And uh, I mean, like I said, it's wonderful. Like it's not many guests that are familiar where the area that I resided here in the Rio Grande Valley. So it's great that you're already familiar with the area, but. Again, the growth, I mean, Dallas-Fort Worth is an enormous school district, Houston, yes. oh my goodness, and then of course Austin, so that is amazing, just the work that you're doing, and then on top of that, like you mentioned, the other six states that you're located in, so that is a lot of substitutes, that is a lot of days covered, that is a lot of, you know, coverage for teachers that may be out for that day, but the students at least are within their same grade level, which I think is something that is important both just for the education sense, but also for student safety as well, making sure that all students are all together. And so I just come in again, you know, thank you so much for the work that you're doing through Swing Education. And I definitely wish you the best. And, you know, of course, you have you've definitely have my support because of just the way that you've described this work and where you're coming from and really sharing the passion that you have for what you do in what started off as a terrible experience for you, you know, having to call agencies and having that rude, you know, clerk that's answering, you know, so telling you, nope, you need five, but you're only going to get four. Yeah. Too bad. You either take it or leave it. And now coming up with a solution into starting in 2012 with, or 2015, you mentioned, right? 2015, yeah, 2015, and you're continuing to grow. So thank you, Mike, for what you do. And so I appreciate it. But before we wrap up, Mike, I always love to end the show with the following three questions. And so let's go ahead and get started with question number one. As we know, every superhero has a weakness. So for example, Superman, his greatest weakness was kryptonite. So I want to ask you, Mike, in the current state of education, what would you say would be your current edu kryptonite? Teacher pay. I mean, I think it's just, it needs to be better in order to attract more candidates. There is a teacher shortage and I, I, maybe there's a, a close adjacent thing of just making teaching more attractive career or job right now. I, I kind of think, especially post COVID, 
I imagine people coming out of college and seeing their friends with like, I don't know, work from home job or they're, or maybe they're only going to the office even two or three days a week. Meanwhile, teaching is tough. You got to be there in person. You don't even get to go to the bathroom whenever you want to. And I think, you know, you couple that with what generally people would say is low pay and it's rough. So, I mean, I think that applies to full-time teachers, substitute teachers too. And I think, yeah. you know, going back to kind of echoing what I'd said earlier too, teachers are trying, you know, and they, we don't need to hamstring them anymore, making their lives more difficult. Absolutely. Great answer, Mike. I appreciate that. All right. My question number two is if you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? A billboard. We've thought a lot about having just swing education billboards. So I think I definitely feel like it's one of these things where you have a lot of people out there that are looking for what their job or career might be. You can, I mean, the success of a lot of the gig economy, I think is interesting since largely I would describe those gig economy jobs as similar in some ways in flexibility to working with swing, but without any of the fulfillment or career progression. And so I think, I think we just have swing education billboards. Perfect. I love it. Simple. Why not to the point and you're marketing yourself, but I love the description that, you know, exactly what you said, that context. So I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And the last question, Mike, is the following is, or the next, the last question I should say is, if you had to write a book starting tomorrow, what would your book be about? It's funny because I, I feel like I've contributed a little bit to a book from the last, a couple of years ago about substitute teaching, and maybe I should write a book about that. But I, I think actually where my head has been at recently, because partly because I have young kids and my oldest is about the same age as swing education, I think I've always learned to be a parent and like a manager at the same time. And there are so many parallels. I feel like I would just take a book about parenting and adapt every piece of advice for being a manager and a leader. <laughs> Absolutely. No, but you know what, Mike? I can actually see that because often, like you mentioned, from your background, going from software and then going into education, I love that parallel because there's transferable skills from what you did to educate and then coming into education. And then, of course, the skills that you gained there too, as well, transferred over to swing education and now, you know, being managing there and a co-founder and so on. Definitely a lot of parallels there between parenting and management. Yeah. So I could definitely see that. Maybe we can call that one swing parenting or I don't know, parenting, yeah. parenting parallels or manage the something like that. We can get creative, but that is wonderful. Mike, I, again, I know I said it a lot and I don't want you to feel like, oh man, this guy's just really complex, but really like this is real for me. It blows my mind in a positive way. I love the work that you're doing. I love the heart that you have behind this. And as always too, because of the way that we're seeing our education space, the need for coverage in our classes, many people may not think about it. Yes, it's there in the news. There might be some areas like maybe in my area where maybe we may not uh, hear about it too much or maybe see it, but we know it's present. But the fact that you're bringing it to light a lot more, but you're offering a solution also as well is something that's wonderful and commendable. So thank you so much, Mike, for being an amazing guest today and sharing the swing education story with us this evening. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. And for all our audience members, those of you that are going to be catching this on the replay, I'm really excited for you to really listen to this episode, but please make sure that you visit our website at myedtech.life, myedtech.life, where you can check out this amazing episode and the other 241 wonderful, wonderful episodes with amazing educators, creators, education practitioners, founders, and co-founders of amazing companies. I promise you that if you go to our website, you're going to find something specifically for you where you can take some knowledge nuggets from and sprinkle them on to what you are already doing great. So please make sure that you also follow us on all socials at My Ed Tech Life. Please make sure you subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast player. And if you can, please visit our YouTube channel, 
give us a thumbs up subscribe to our channel we definitely want to get to a thousand followers there guys and i want to thank you all for all your support and those of you that have gone to subscribe to our channel thank you so much because as you know we do what we do for you so week in and week out we can bring you some amazing content amazing conversations and just an amazing learning experience for you so thank you as always from the bottom of my heart and until next time my friends don't forget Stay techie.